Great to hear from Professor Descupta just now, and thank you all for joining us for our question and answer session on nature. I'm Helen Slinger, Executive Director at A4S, and I'm here with uh, Rishi Kalra, Managing Director and CFO of Olam Food Ingredients, and Tony O'Sullivan, Founder of Pollination. Welcome, Rishi. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. Fantastic to have you here with us today. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing your views on this important subject and indeed your reflections on what we have just heard from Professor Sapatha Descupta. What I propose to do is to use my chair's privilege and ask a few questions of my own and then go to the audience for some of theirs. So to everyone who's watching, please do add your questions in the Q&A feed on your screens. So I'll come to you first, Rishi. Why does nature matter to business? I, uh, thanks, Alan, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I have been associated with A4S for many years now, and, and while this time the summit is happening more remotely, but gives us all an opportunity to be involved, engaged, and listen in to what is happening, and be updated from a finance fraternity perspective on why uh, finance can play a big role in sustainability. So on your question, Helen, uh, why nature matters uh, to business? I believe nature matters to most industries, uh, while on some it is much more pronounced than others. And being in the agri sector, from our perspective, I really see three critical aspects. The first and foremost being uh, dependency. Uh, like I said, some industries are more reliant on uh, nature. Agriculture and food based like ours clearly has a big impact on what happens from a natural capital perspective. Land and water are inherent to our business as also as biodiversity. Insects are at the heart of every food web. They pollinate most plant species, keep the health, soil healthy. So for us, we are really dependent on uh, Mother Earth and nature. Second being uh, financial performance. Uh, there is a clear link of nature to our profitability and performance. Uh, changes in nature, especially due to climate change or weather, etc., can impact the viability of many supply chains uh, and, and clearly has a direct link on our productivity, yields, and crops that come out of uh, uh, the fields and the farms that we operate within. Uh, many of our commodities like uh, almonds, coffee, etc., rely on biodiverse uh, environments. Uh, and for us, it becomes very important that the biodiversity is protected. We get uh, uh, give them the nature and habitat to operate within because they have a clear impact on, again, the productivity and yield that we get and a link to our financial performance as well. Last but not the least, uh, it is also about doing the right thing. Uh, uh, the mindset is changing very rapidly. Natural capital assets have, while being traditionally seen as freely available, self-maintaining or somebody else's responsibilities, but that is no longer the position. Uh, employees, organizations, customers, consumers, everybody is more aware and attuned and would rather be involved and engaged with organizations that are thinking long term, clearly understand the implication of nature to their organization and beyond them to the consumers and uh, the future of uh, the world. So I think it is it is very relevant and no organization, no business can stay away from not having a link or understanding nature in its entirety. Great, thank you, Rishi. No business can stay away from their responsibility on nature. Tony, um, having spent over 30 years of your career in financial services and investment banking, you've now founded Pollination, um, which I understand is a specialist climate change advisory and investment firm. And you seek to accelerate the transition to a net zero climate resilient future. Great to hear your views from an investment perspective. Why does nature matter? Thanks very much, Alan. Um, I think one of the interesting aspects of uh, Professor Sir Partha Dasgupta's uh, talk just now is where he talks about financial risk. And um, if we and I'd like to sort of separate that for a moment from the opportunities because um, I think what we've seen in climate, in the climate space, is a, is a pretty close analogy to what's probably got to occur with natural capital. And by that, um, there was a very interesting paper done by the group of 30 in October um, this year, which was chaired by Mark Carney and Janet Yellen. And in that, they, they talk a lot about market signals and uh, there's an interesting sort of part that they mention. They say uh, the financial system needs to play a decisive role in accelerating and amplifying the effectiveness of public policies. 
And by that, what they were saying is uh, you can't just have the attraction, if you like, of the benefit of investing in natural capital on its own. In that particular case, they were talking about climate. And, uh, but what they were saying is without the stick, if you like, uh, you won't actually get a shift of market sentiment. And so back to the point of financial risk, on the advisory side of Polynesian's business, we spend a lot of time with uh, governments and boards um, because uh, the, the stakeholders that are surrounding boardrooms now includes not just shareholders, but there are proxy firms, uh, there are insurers, credit rating agencies, climate litigation funds. Um, there, are, there are quite a few different parties, if you like, uh, that are very well informed in, in, indeed as well. And uh, what's happening is there is now a direct correlation uh, between a company's ESG score and its cost of capital. And so one of the things that we do is when we go into C companies, often, um, not often these days, but certainly a few years ago, uh, there would be climate deniers. And so we would actually approach it from a different angle. We would approach it from the point of view of, um, do you want to have a lower cost of capital? Do you want to have a higher market capitalization? Do you want to have a higher PE than your peers? Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why the cost of capital has actually become higher for those that are actually not transitioning their firms and not taking steps is because of public policy. So I, again, then drawing the analogy to, so when the professor talks about financial risk with respect to natural capital, uh, we're seeing it already. So everyone knows about TCFD reporting in the climate space. There is now TNFD. So there's a task force for uh, the nature uh, uh, financial disclosure. And uh, there's a secretary formed already. And in fact, we're part of uh, a working group on that. And so that's likely to come out in 2021, 2022. Mm -hmm. And so that means in the same way that people are actually looking at um, uh, climate disclosure, uh, you're going to have insurance companies and, and others measuring not just the cost of capital of companies, but there's now actually also a direct correlation to the quality of the executive depending on your score. So I think the big risk coming uh, in climate, you talk, people talk about stranded assets and the like. Uh, we're going to have another suite of, um, I can talk about the opportunities um, perhaps later on, but I think it's going to be public policy, the stick, which is actually going to uh, force people to reconsider investments in natural capital. Okay, great, thank you. And Rishi, as an agricultural business, as you mentioned earlier, you're explicitly dependent on, on nature. Now, can you share some examples of work that Olam has done to understand the natural capital on which you rely as a business and how that's influenced your strategy? Sure, Belen. Um, so for us, uh, it is, our strategy actually has been developed from our point of view of the future, in which, uh, the, like I was explaining earlier, Nature has uh, in many ways been interlinked and into our business so for us has played a very heavy role in even our shaping of our own strategy. We rely heavily on land, biodiversity and water and, and need all to be protected for our existence. And we also see this as both a need as well as a differentiator. So for us, it has been really very intricately developed into when we built up our own strategy. But the first and foremost requirement was to assess a starting point. That is where the challenge always has been, I think, uh, Professor Das Gupta also, when he referred to some of his uh, work, uh, clearly there is a need for understanding uh, the capitals, understanding how they can be measured and as well reported. And so for us, the first and foremost was our baseline, our starting point to understand what is the actions on our, uh, of the things that we do on the ground and the impact. We have uh, developed along with uh, other people who have been with the journey on with us, certain tools. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I want to talk about is our OLAM power information system, which helps us understand and represent ground realities using graphic uh, tools. And we have already mapped 430,000 farmers in around 20 countries uh, who are registered on that. And more than 3,000 enumerators who undertake farm surveys uh, through GPS data and points to capture exact locations of our farms. Which through the time we know where we are present, not only directly as OLAM, but even our supply chain and our farmers who we work with, uh, we can't really start or see what is the impact that is being caused uh, through nature. 
And then once we assess the need and the impact, we are also able to deploy training programs, uh, sustainable farm management, which finally helps in improving uh, productivity. So the first and foremost was really about uh, putting in some of these systems. So I talked about one. Mm -hmm. And then working with other third party organizations, we can't do this all alone. It, it is very much an evolving uh, topic. So we partner with people who come with similar ideas, thought process, and help us understand our natural capital better. And we've done that with many partners uh, in this journey. So I think it's, it's all about uh, knowing where your baseline is, understanding the impacts, engaging and embedding with your strategy, which is how we have shaped it. So our strategy is really linked to all capitals and more specifically natural capital, because that is really at the heart of uh, what we are in an agri uh, industry. Great, thank you. And, and as CFO, you obviously need to be on the front foot with anything that poses significant risk to the success of your strategy. So how do you assess, manage and mitigate the risks associated with long term sustainability of the natural world and its, and its central role within your strategy? Sure, absolutely. I think uh, it's a very valid point and very important. It is not only about doing uh, the right thing, it's also about knowing how to measure, track and report upon that. So like I was explaining earlier, the first and foremost was getting our baseline right and using the tools that we deployed, we at least understood uh, what is our starting position, what are the numbers and the data to track upon. Second was, and I think that has been a very key differentiator for us, was our linking up finance and sustainability together. So we said it is not just about a concept and doing the right thing. How do we get it into a numerical language that business can understand? And we developed a tool uh, which we call our integrated impact statement. It's mm -hmm. a tool for analyzing and measuring uh, natural capital externalities amongst other uh, capitals as well. And forming uh, known methodologies and using data that we collate from on the ground, we are able to, in a simple to understand profit loss balance sheet and risk and opportunity statement, provide to our business teams uh, the stock position, the impact beyond just what gets reported in the financial uh, statement. So I think that has been really one of the biggest change and impact that has created both internally and also as we look at it from an external reporting perspective. The other was, uh, uh, and I think that is something that many organizations are thinking about and it's probably the right way to go. Uh, we also set up a dedicated team of uh, finance uh, professionals working on sustainability. This cannot be only done by the champions who have been in the past uh, uh, looking at sustainability as a CRNS department. It was about embedding it within finance and the business units. So we set up a dedicated team and they really focused on trying to understand uh, the linkage of the work on the ground, the actions that we take and the impact in a numerical language. So I think that has been another key thing and differentiator from a finance and uh, OLAM perspective. But it hasn't been easy, to be honest. Uh, we've had our own share of uh, challenges uh, in trying to understand mythologies, trying to put it into an easy to understand form. Uh, and uh, data itself has been an issue at times. But, but as we move into digitalization and getting all these things in place, I think we have done fairly well. And I do at least realize that as a CFO, it is helping us in mitigating the risks associated for the long term. Uh, so CEOs are happy, people know what we are doing, and we are able to report it. And more importantly, understand first uh, what this means to us. Great, thank you. And Tony, in your experience, how can investors respond to nature related risks and opportunities when they're setting their investment strategy and, and indeed when taking investment or divestment decisions? Uh, well, it's, um, thanks, Alan. It's interesting, Rishi's comment on, on data just then, because uh, that's something that's really important. Um, uh, I mean, how do you price risk and return relative to its impact? Um, will become an integral part of uh, the financial strategy and reporting for natural capital as you go forward. What we do is we fully integrate the impact into the investment and as asset allocation and risk and return decisions. With our various funds, uh, what's interesting is that quite a few of the investors are actually making the allocation out of their impact uh, bucket of the portfolio, if you like, rather than real assets or, or infrastructure. Uh, ecosystem services underpin the productive and earnings performance of all the real assets, whether they're agri, uh, forestry, carbon, and, uh, and there's, therefore it's really important to consider the return from uh, the nature risk uh, perspective. In addition to looking at the downside risk and the impact additionality, um, we seek to quantify the value upside from investing in the right assets. Um, one of um, 
the investment houses Lombard Odia has recently released a, um, a product which is looking specifically at that. They've, uh, they're screening the market in public securities, looking for companies which will actually um, have a positive outcome in terms of the shift, if you like, to, uh, to natural capital. Uh, we've developed a framework and a model that adjusts the cost of capital calculations relative to the natural capital attributes and uh, the risk and market forecasts. And so we expect that as this thematic and market matures, uh, you'll see actually um, yield compression um, when people start to actually understand how to price the natural capital risk and opportunities. And, and you think it's fair to say you're some way ahead of uh, many investors on this agenda. Um, but I'd like to explore how other investors can, can learn from what you've done. So do you have some sort of top tips um, that you may have for them or some, some simple first steps um, that they could maybe take? Well, we, we spend a lot of time um, focusing on the measurement of impact. In fact, we actually acquired a firm which we thought was the leading firm, um, My Pioneer Capital. And... And we brought in uh, what, who we thought was the leading, the world's leading uh, measurer, if you like, of the impact of nature-based solutions investing. And this particular person, James Cairns, had been doing it in Africa um, and a lot of other places, but was really, it was one of the frontier people in trying to understand how to develop this model. What we're now doing with that IP is we're augmenting that with a corporate finance overlay and we're speaking with uh, two leading universities here in the UK that are assisting us. And we want to make this um, a very robust measurement for the, uh, for the, for the, we want it to become a gold standard, if you like, for, for the industry and to be open source and, and accepted by, by everyone as, as that standard. Uh, but I, I do think, and back to Rishi's point, it's, it is about the data um, it's, it's really important that, uh, and, and that's one of the difficulties because it is such a nascent thematic, um, we're building that up now, but, um, um, but we've certainly, we're spending a disproportionate amount of time on measurement. Great. Thank you. Um, and Rishi, what about your investors? You know, what questions are you receiving from them about, about alarms practices as related to, to nature restoration and maintenance and, and have you seen those investor views evolve at all in recent times? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I think everybody is taking notes. So investor community is no different. And which is the right thing to do as well, because it has to come both uh, as an expectation beyond just uh, doing what you have to. If, if there is pressure from all sides, uh, people will take note and also change if they're not already. The ones that really come to us uh, are around, uh, first and foremost, being in agriculture is around deforestation risk. There's been a great deal of focus around deforestation uh, on some of our commodities and how do we manage that. And customers also getting uh, demanding on their actions on what are we doing on the ground, eliminating unsustainable forest loss, degradation in the supply chain, something that we are very active on. But it's always good to see that uh, even investor community is taking note of that. The second, uh, which all of us are very cognizant of and uh, is probably more understood uh, on what is happening is around climate risk. There has been an increasing collective realization uh, from every sector that it has a potential driver of business risk in a sector. So uh, people want to understand what are we doing on that? Uh, are the right actions being taken? Are we reporting right? Are we measuring right? So again, uh, the area that really comes out in our sector is around climate as well. Third, which is more positive, is around sustainable financing. So the idea is that uh, this also gives us opportunities. So investors also want to see and demand the action being taken one being that we are an ESG compliant uh, organization, uh, our ability to showcase that through raising money differentially and being a true differentiator from a cost of capital has also been important. And, and, and we've had many successes. We were the first ones in Asia to raise a, a sustainable club loan, and we have followed it up over the last three years with many others. So I think we uh, doing the right thing also uh, has an advantage. So I think uh, investor community also takes notes and sees that you are different. You're doing the right things. But they'd rather question you to be sure that you were on uh, your watch as well. Thank you. Um, and, and Tony, um, at Pollination, obviously, you, you focus a great deal on, on climate change. Um, but what lessons from that climate conversation can be applied to nature, especially given that the lack of action 
in nature could be just as, if not more, catastrophic. Uh, thanks, Helen. Well, I think climate, which has, of course, been around a little bit longer, it's got some of these um, easy, um, if I can call them bumper stickers almost, uh, net zero, 1.5, and natural capital could actually probably benefit from having some sort of easy to grasp labels uh, like that. Um, it is now, of course, getting a lot more attention now that there's um, this working group on uh, financial disclosure of um, natural capital risk as opposed to climate risk. But I think that, as Rishi just said, um, a biodiversity and climate really do go hand in hand. In a lot of the natural capital opportunities that we're looking at, um, the investment return is, is going to be enhanced by carbon offsets. So that's that's actually quite a big part of um, of natural capital. Um, look, I, I think in terms of um, what, um, if there are any lessons learned, um, if you go back to when Mark Carney made his famous tragedy of the horizon speech at Lloyd's in 2015, he was warning people that, uh, that there was going to be a sudden jump, if you like, in terms of the depreciation of assets. And he was imploring people back then um, to be aware of this, that you know he was giving guidance to help see people see around corners. And he was actually talking to an audience, funnily enough, the insurers that were actually probably the most, uh, the best informed because they're taking the reinsurance risk. It's now fast forward five years and we now see, uh, I would describe it as almost panic by some companies and, mm -hmm. corporate and governments uh, when they're looking at, they're being forced by their investors or by their constituents to come out with uh, deadlines for getting to net zero emissions, but um, there there is no architecture or planning or transition pathway for actually getting to that point. Um, and I think uh, there's no reason why the same thing's not going to happen with natural capital if people don't become aware of um, the risk. But I, I hasten to add the opportunities as well. There are a lot of opportunities. Maybe you could talk to us a little about those opportunities. What are the kind of key things that are out there that companies are currently missing, do you think? Sure. Well, the ones that are, um, that are not actually um, pricing in the, the free riding externalities, if you like, um, mm -hmm. they're the ones that are certainly going to, going to come, come at somewhat of a shock. There are many, many companies that are actually seeing round corners and can actually see, for example, what's happening with the circular economy. And uh, there are those that are actually uh, trying to inform by means of their current reporting. See, a lot of people look at, for example, the their annual reports, compliance checks, even with TCFD, and they sort of see this as uh, yet another compliance burden. Other, I think, companies are actually seeing it as a way of telling their story. So all those stakeholders I mentioned earlier, the shareholders, the insurers, the credit rating agencies, the climate litigation funds, all these different people, uh, you can tell them a story and, and paint a different picture. And so you can actually, uh, I mean, the other thing, of course, you can do is when you are actually looking at your climate transition pathway, you know, don't silo natural capital as a separate pathway in a, in a different level of the building. Um, make sure this is all joined up and indeed even with other strategies that you you have going on in your, in the building if you like at the same time uh, so in terms of specific opportunities um, we're focusing on regenerative agriculture um, and so what we're trying to say to people is uh, if you've been doing impact a lot of impact is admirable but at small scale and so for sovereign wealth funds and pensions that often uh, are making bigger allocations, it's it's just very difficult to get into that space. For agriculture, uh, it's often without impact and, and in some cases without commercial return. So we are genuinely trying to actually build all three and we're doing the same thing on the forestry side. And we also, um, we call it uh, a third category of investments frontier, but we're doing things in fisheries and we're looking at, for example, uh, the planting of uh, mangroves on coastlines uh, because the sequestration abilities of mangrove, for example, compared to forest, it's a big multiplier 
but it's also doing benefits to the coastline and it's acting as a, a resilience measure against cyclones and that sort of thing. So we're trying to sort of also uh, approach this from the point of view of uh, is there an overall benefit from a climate resilience uh, perspective? Is it doing good for nature? And if there are carbon offsets um, involved as well, then that's a bonus. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And, and Rishi, Tony talked just there about um, using the annual report to tell your story. And obviously that's something that, that you do very well. It's probably a good reference for some of the listeners if they're wanting to do the same. Um, just a question from the audience for you, Rishi. Um, Professor Descripta mentioned um, supply chain disruption. Um, you know, how can companies work with their supply chain to protect biodiversity and nature? Sure. Um, so, yes. So probably, if, uh, I think, uh, like I was explaining, in our business, we are really integrally involved uh, through the supply chain. And it is not only about the actions of what we can control, it is also about the people that get linked in the overall supply chain. And specifically on biodiversity, I think uh, one aspect of what I touched upon when I was speaking at the summit two years ago in 2018, and is still very relevant, is on bees. Mm -hmm. So I'll touch upon that as a very relevant uh, topic. Uh, for most of the listeners and most of the people who uh, would not know, uh, bees is all about a pot of honey. Uh, but for industry like ours, it is, uh, it is about existing for some of our uh, uh, crops. Uh, they play such a key role in pollination, whether it is in almonds, and many other commodities that people don't even understand, they can't be pollinated if there was a lack of pollinators like bees. Uh, in Olam and in our, some of our farms, you were seeing our productivity and yields going down considerably. Uh, and, uh, and we used to spend a lot of money in getting uh, bees to come and pollinate our farms. So while you're paying the money and uh, the bees were brought to the farm, but they were not doing the job. So it's not about paying money to uh, your teams and people and expecting them to do what they have to. This is about paying money and not getting uh, what you expect as an output. And the reason was very simple. The bees were uh, overworked. They were being taken from farm to farm, not ours. This is bees that we spend and hire from uh, bee managers, from bee owners. Uh, and uh, we realized that they were not being given a natural habitat. So we worked along with General Mills and the Zerse Society and provided a natural habitat for, uh, for the bees. And when we saw them being deployed on our farms, the productivity and the yields just went up. So it is about knowing the impacts of what is happening, how is all these challenges impacting us, and then uh, taking the right actions. And the action is not directly about what you can do and control yourself, it's also in your supply chain. So I think there are many ways of doing it. It is first understanding and appreciating that where in your supply chain are you getting impacted either by uh, land, water, or biodiversity. And then going all the way through and understanding the financial link of the action that you take, and hopefully make it a differentiator. So, Many people will think it is a cost. For us, it's really a big and key differentiator. So give your bees a holiday resort, as it were, rather than just working them hard all the time. <laughs> it's it's right. the same for us. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so um, one of the things that Professor Descriptor talked about, he said that we were all asset managers, but that we're failing to manage our portfolio. Um, Tony, you know, what does managing our portfolio look like when we're thinking about natural capital? Um, well, at the moment, there's um, uh, there's very little uh, historic returns, if you like, uh, you know, in terms of um, the investment thematic that we're uh, that we're currently looking at. I think the way to think about it, in terms of your portfolio, is think about it as option value, uh, because and, and don't think of it uh, necessarily as as a yield investment, as a P and L investment day one. Um, think about this as balance sheet and it's longer term. In fact, you know, we're, we're talking about um, with our funds 15-year um, term because, you know, it, it's uh, a lot of them are going to be greenfield projects as well. And so, um, so it is a different way of actually um, looking at it. But I would sort of, in looking at my portfolio, so in terms of my exi existing portfolio rather than what I want to buy, I would go back to what the professor said in terms of look for the risk Look for the financial risk. Look for the companies which, I mean, it's very easy now for people to find climate risk. When I say very easy, it's it's become a lot easier in the last 12 months. And uh, it stands out now, quite obviously, which companies are going to have stranded assets, which companies are going to have difficulty rolling over even their term loans because of the cost of capital or, or um, 
investor resistance. And so, um, so look ahead at that. But then if you want to actually see in the listed space, uh, I think uh, having a look at um, what Lombard 80 has done is, is not a bad start to actually um, have a look at how they're screening future opportunities in the listed space. And, and I think it's um, they've got quite a sensible approach there in looking at a, a series of thematics, if you like, from, as I said before, circular economy to um, to companies which are, it's a little bit like looking for the companies making the shovels on the gold rush. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. Uh, they're, they're trying to identify those companies now. Um, and so, so I think there's two parts to it. Look for the risk in your existing portfolio. And uh, if it's listed, investments you're looking at. Um, have a look at the Lombard Odia offering. Great, thank you. I think we've maybe got time for one more question. Um, so I'll probably come to both of you. So Rishi, starting with you. Um, you talked a little bit about the measurement um, that you have in place. Um, and obviously, it's easy to measure the things that you're doing. But how can you measure, you know, that the actions you're taking are actually making a difference to the natural world? Yeah, it's a it's a very it's a very valid question and a very big one that it is not easy to be honest, but you have to make a start. And uh, if you were to look back a few years ago, it was much more difficult because people didn't understand one the concept and second it was very difficult to form a link to a financial or a dollar numerical number. Uh, so the first and foremost is understanding of what really matters to you as an organization. Where is it that you're creating the biggest impact? Then getting the data. Uh, so the other challenge will come along getting the data to understand what this means. Now there are enough uh, protocols and guidelines available, tools available, even the work that Air Force has done within the CFO networks and chapters is through the guides and tools that already exist. Trying to replicate and embed them within your organization will help you in understanding this and giving it a financial link. So getting your baseline right, then understanding how can you really make a difference because then it is all about the positive chain that you're making. I don't think it is about a lot of people and a lot of organizations get worried that if my capital impacts or if I start looking at these numbers, they come out as a big negative. Uh, is it going to be uh, something harmful or will the investors or anybody else see it uh, with a negative lens? I frankly don't think that is uh, true. So it is about knowing where your starting point is, wherever it is, and then improving it year on year. So if you know your starting point and you're improving, I think you're doing a good job. And that is what each of us has to really commit to. That's how I see it from an organizational perspective. Great, thank you. And Tony, same question, you know, how can you measure the actions that you're taking, that they are indeed making a difference, especially given there's so many stakeholders? Uh, well, we, um, as, as I said earlier, we, we, we spend um, an inordinate amount of time measuring, measuring that ink impact through a prism of, um, uh, you know, have we improved the biodiversity of, of a particular area, um, what have we done? We actually look at the social factors quite closely as well, because, um, you know, if you actually speak to uh, people like S&P in New York, um, the S in ESG is going to actually become far more important. And you've got, uh, as you do with climate, you've got a significant overlap between environment and, and the S in terms of what are you doing with communities as well? Are you leaving the world a better place? Um, not just with respect to, um, I mean, the human capital is part of that, uh, the, the natural ecosystem as well. And so, um, so we do actually focus on that quite closely as well. But we do have a, um, uh, it's about reporting. If you want people to invest, um, or if we want people to invest in our funds out of an impact allocation, uh, they'll only do that if they are receiving um, detailed assessments of the impact of their natural natural capital investments so we're um, we're very focused on that and and when we um, when we go live with our funds we'll be publishing um, if you like the the measurement tools that we're using um, in order to do that so they'll be available for people to look at great thank you very much and, and thank you very much to, to both of you um, for spending time with us today. Thank you very much, Tony, for getting up so early to talk to us. Um, okay. And thanks very much to our audience for some great questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.